Hello everyone. Welcome back to another Live at Five. I am your host, curator Kevin Adkison with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today I wanted to conclude a little bit the tour that we started last Wednesday. Last Wednesday, those of you who were with me or who were watching online know we looked at the Woodward Avenue entrance. And so today I'm at the other end of this curving, lovely road, which as it was being constructed, after having been first planned in the 1950s and then laid out in the 1980s, what the ad hoc committee on the Woodward Access Road discovered was that they were going to need something to mark the arrival to campus. And so Dan Hoffman with the arrival or with the entrance feature on Woodward Avenue, he was marking when you got to Cranbrook. So if you were coming from Detroit or from the highway, you knew you were at Cranbrook because you were at his little uh, pavilion. But the problem was you weren't actually anywhere. There was nowhere from the Woodward Avenue entrance that marked where you might want to go. You simply had reached the 319 and a half acre property. You hadn't actually gotten where you wanted to go. And so it was thought that we needed a place that would mark the arrival to campus. The original plan that had been developed by George Bard of Bard Simpson and JJR of Ann Arbor proposed bringing the new Woodward Avenue entrance into a T intersection. And so the cars coming from Woodward reach the campus here and they can turn right and they can head to the art academy or the art museum or they can turn left and they will reach out to the Cranbrook Institute of Science. And those of you who have been around Cranbrook long enough know that used to the sort of dirt road, the one lane road that did connect that side of campus, it came up in front of the Institute of Science and then brought you directly into the Institute way. And so the change was made in 1987 to propose this new way of cutting through the woods so that cars would be forced to come to a complete stop. The fear was that if they came directly into the art museum, this road would become like a super highway. And so cars would never, uh, other than a stop sign, they would never be sort of forced to stop and realize that they are now in the middle of a very dense pedestrian campus. And so the T intersection was thought to be most safe. And it also gave us the impetus of building something to announce the arrival. And it was very much up in the air what this would be. You'll remember from last week's tour that there was a international competition uh, held in, in 1991 or 92 in order to select a designer and architect for the Woodward Avenue entrance pavilion. That was not done here because the whole need of the arrival feature had not yet been sort of laid out. And so it came in the process of building the road and it was decided just like the arrival feature that in the end we would design it internally. And then all of that changed uh, after a visit in 1993 by the Finnish architect Wani Palasma. And Wani Palasma had been invited to be one of the judges for the Woodward Avenue entrance pavilion competition. He couldn't get out of commitments in Helsinki in order to be a judge, which is probably for the best since he later received a commission directly related to the competition. Would have been a little uncouth if he had been a judge and then gotten the commission. But Mr. Palasma was in Helsinki when he finally was traveling to the United States uh, in January of 1993 to take up a semester's long position as the Aero Saarinen Visiting Professor at Yale School of Architecture. And so the Saarinen Professorship is one of the oldest professorships at the former School of Art and Architecture, now the School of Architecture. I actually forget who was the 
Sarnen professor when I was there, but you get a nice office, you get a, a year-long studio, and you're also in New Haven for the year. And there's a number of architects who have launched from Yale into American commissions. I'm thinking of Columbus, Indiana. Uh, the Erwin Miller professor originally came with a building. And so when Palasma was uh, living here in New, or in New England for the year, he visited Cranbrook in March of 1993. That's when he met Dr. Lillian Bowder, the president and CEO, who was helping to construct and bring this road into reality. And he was visiting the Department of Architecture at the Academy. And he realized quite quickly, along with Dan Hoffman, that the design challenge of these two projects was less so an architectural challenge than a landscape challenge. And so the road you'll notice is not a straight shot. And the roads that George Booth had built around his property in uh, the early, early 20th century were often sort of hugging the landscape, but they were more or less direct. The road that was planned for Woodward Access was meant to be an experience, and so it carves through the landscape going left and right. And this really became a passion project of Dr. Bowder. As Daniel Hoffman later recalled, uh, the road just seemed to take Lillian over. And so they used to walk through the road and think about how it would be used as uh, cars came in and out of campus. And on that 1993 visit to campus, Dan Hoffman and Wani Palasa, Palasma discussed the idea of what would mark the arrival. Now, last week, I, I pointed out the rough granite wall that is by the Woodward Avenue entrance. Here you see another 1994 wall that is now done with the split-faced rubble spo uh, stone that most of Cranbrook's external walls are. Other than the walls around Cranbrook House and the property walls, you don't see this type of wall anywhere else on the campus. And this was done to tie it back to the original George Booth walls and to also represent the sort of civilizing force. You have arrived to the center of campus and the walls have gone from rough boulders into this more masoned, uh, treated wall. Then you get to our super safe T intersection which the trees have changed a bit over the years, but as designed, there were towering firs on three out of four sides of the intersection. And Palasma, some of these trees were already here. He planted more. He thought that the firs um, were these sort of giant sentinels that were guarding over the arrival feature, and they helped transition us from the world of sort of Woodward Avenue, strip malls and cars and fast, the daily life, to the sort of spiritual world of campus. And he thought of them as having this sort of quiet, stern grandeur. And he wanted the arrival feature to give us a sense of melancholy as you turn the corner. Now he was designing it for a car, and that's very different than really any other Cranbrook buildings. Um, these two projects are unique, the, the Woodward Access uh, entrance feature and the arrival feature, and that they're designed to be understood through a windshield. Now, before I go through all of the details of this project, I want to talk a little bit more about Wani Palasma himself. Um, this project, I think the best description I ever read was the Cranbrook's enigmatic arrival feature. And I'm not sure how much any of what I'm about to tell you is legible um, when you're actually visiting Cranbrook, uh, but this is what I know from the archives, from Palasma's own um, records. Interestingly, like many buildings, um, I think that this arrival feature was very well received in 1995 when it was completed. Um, the arrival feature was compared instead of a floating leaf or spreading, uh, spreading wings or uh, sort of floating vision on the hillside. The arrival feature was often called the uh, Cranbrook's gas station. I think now 25 years on, um, the arrival feature, I, I'm not sure has held up as well. Um, it is certainly enigmatic, and I find the entrance feature to be really quite beautiful still 25 years on. 
But Wani Palasma, the architect of this landscape intervention, I hesitate to use the word sculpture and I'm not sure architecture quite fits, um, though both you would not be wrong in using them. But this sort of environmental design uh, came from Wani Palasma. And Palasma was born in 1936 in Hanemlima, uh, which is a, a major town in Finland in the center. It's an inland town. It's where Sibelius is from. Uh, and he uh, went on to study architecture. And in the late 1960s, early 1970s, he was really interested in this uh, movement that there were concurrent movements in America, probably most famous in Italy and in England, but these sort of prefabricated, rationalized utopias. And so he was in his early architectural practice interested in sort of standardization, prefabrication. It was this very anti-idiosyncratic way of working, anti-Alvar Alto, which if you're ever thinking to be against one of the greatest architects to ever live, Alvar Alto, you are making a mistake. And Mr. Palasma, I think, realized the airs of his way, and he began to embrace the sort of uniqueness of the far north of Finnish design history. And he came to be known as an educator and a theoretician as much as an architect. In particular, he was the head of the, um, or the director of the Finnish Architecture Museum, which is where Loya Saarinen left most of her husband's drawings, so all of the uh, Aelial Saarinen's architectural records. Mr. Palasma was overseeing the museum that housed those. And then he became the dean of Helsinki Institute of Technology, which is where Aelial Saarinen had studied back in the 1880s and 90s. Um, and so he was known as this um, thinker of Finnish architecture and his buildings, um, he's not quite a paper architect, he has always had buildings being built, but he is less well known for his uh, buildings than he is from these leadership positions, in particular his essays and his book, um, a real seminal work on phenomenology and architecture, The Eyes of the Skin, Architecture in the Skin S Senses. And that was published in 96, and it dealt with the idea that essentially architecture is an art that we always consider through one sense, sight. Uh, and so how can buildings interact with the rest of the five senses? Uh, he talks in the book about having to lick green and green architecture in Pasadena and having to touch the stone. Um, he talks about all architecture starting with the mouth as the primitive cave from which all shelter emanates. Um, it's a good book. If you're going to think about architecture and phenomenology, I would go with Charles Moore, The Body, Memory, and Architecture, written with Kent Bloomer, but that shows my own Yale bias. Uh, needless to say, he was a significant figure in architecture, still is, and uh, I think that this is an important work of his theories uh, realized in the built world. And so let's start looking at the entire design. It starts with this 84-foot uh, uh, diameter disc which is defined at the perimeter with a concrete barrier. Originally, it was to have a Corten steel barrier. And the 80-foot um, diameter disc had to be cut in on two corners in order for safety. Uh, the engineers did not agree with Palasma that people would come to a disc and know what to do. Uh, and so they demanded that these corners be cut in. Uh, but the disc is defined by due north, south, and east-west cardinal direction. So here we have the north-south marking, which is done in stainless steel. And then at the dead center of the circle, uh, you have a concrete marking that is going east-west. Originally, these were all going to be in Corten steel. Uh, the decision to use stainless steel after, actually came after Dan Hoffman switched his design at the Woodward Avenue entrance to use stainless steel column supports instead of bronze. Uh, the idea was to use the same material palette here as we were using at the Woodward guard booth. Now, we're watching, walking across these aggregate stones which are set in a sand base on a concrete pad, and you see they have this lovely texture. And this was somewhat of a compromise, and 
I don't have any reflections on Mr. Palasma's own thoughts about this compromise, but I imagine he was disappointed. What he wanted to see happen was to use tiny river rocks at the center and then lay them in a spiral going all the way out and out. And so you would eventually have chunky sort of rocky boulders that you would drive across in this huge spiral. I think it would have enhanced the idea of this being a circular disc. And what he really wanted the idea, again, of phenomenology uh, was that you would be driving over these thick boulders and you would feel it in the car. So you not only see the architecture through the windshield, but you feel the change. Now, if you can feel something with your tire, um, first of all, you're in Michigan because our roads are awful. Uh, but second of all, how do you plow that? And so the decision was made that a snow plow would simply pop these little boulders out every winter. And so we went with a most, both a much cheaper but an easier to maintain system. Palasma wanted to heat the whole disc, which would have solved the, the problem, but increased the price even more. Interestingly, Frank Lloyd Wright always had his driveways done in pea gravel for the same idea that you would hear the pea gravel under uh, the tires as you drove into the house. And Frank Lloyd Wright was a great inspiration to Palasma. Uh, he quotes Wright throughout his uh, The Eyes of the Skin book. So now that we have talked a little bit about the disc, let's talk about our runway lights. Um, these lights form a light barrier along the eastern edge of the disc. This was Another example where Palasma, through his um, American executor, Dan Hoffman, successfully fought off the traffic engineers who said, you really need a, a barrier on this side. Palasma said, no, we'll use runway lights and we'll create a uh, light edge instead of interrupting the disc. The lights, unfortunately, no longer work. I would love to see them restored. Um, because you were meant to sort of approach in the dark. Imagine cresting this hill and seeing these rays of light coming up and sort of backed by the columns, the bronze, and then it would be wonderful to replant the firs behind here as well. So as we move on, we have talked about one great circle, 84 feet, two cardinal directions, north and south. Next, we will talk about the three spaces between these four bronze discs. Then we'll talk about the five spaces between six columns. All of these numbers are coming from Mr. Palasma because there's nothing here that's not intentional. So starting with the cast bronze discs, safely ensconced away from the traffic, the three spaces are connected with stainless steel um, connectors, these pins that are holding the bronze plates. Uh, and again, the stainless steel is tied back to the Woodward entrance. And each of these four bronze plates were cast in Finland. They were cast by Jarmo Sorekas, um, and they, he is a fine art bronze caster. And they were meant to be cast and not rolled so that you would have these wonderful um, uh, sort of texture to the bronze. And Wani Palasma wanted this to tie into all of the Carl Millis bronzes throughout campus uh, and sort of relate back to our history of art and architecture. Now, each of the bronze panels feature different astrological signs. Here we have the northern celestial hemisphere with the different stars depicted. Next is the southern celestial hemisphere, and then the winter eclipse and the summer ecliptic. And so this line here is showing the route of the sun across the sky uh, for both the winter and then the summer. And so that's the, the sort of orientation of what Earth is seeing as it rotates around space. And of course, we are on this great circular disk and you can see the skies. And so there is this sort of scientific relationship. Uh, Mr. Palasma wanted this complex, this arrival feature to embody both mystery and scientific complexity, to be both spiritual, scientific, and abstract. It's also interesting, he designed it, uh, he wrote with three ideas in mind, art, 
science, which are of course on either side of the arrival feature, and the automobile. But begin because I'm on this side of the bronze wall, which is the pedestrian side. I have all of these wonderful little details and all of the words written in that I can learn. But then when you get to the automobile side, there's nothing cast. It's just uh, the patina of the bronze, which you can appreciate through the car. Now, there are four bronze panels, and these four bronze panels have a number of different meanings. Um, we can think of them either as the four seasons, the four equinoxes and solstices, or the four saarinens, um, Aelil, Loya, Hipson, and Aero, who immigrated to America from Finland in 1923 and got here to Cranbrook in 1925. And so Wani Palasma thinks of the Great Bronze Wall as being the four Saarinens, uh, cast made in Finland of Finnish, um, uh, sort of Finnish earth, and then immigrating, shipping here to Cranbrook and settling here permanently, which of course they did. Then we get to the six columns, which are Canadian. And maybe you, you realize where I'm going here. So the six columns are bored from Canadian earth and then shipped here permanently to uh, Cranbrook. And who is the great Canadian who comes to Cranbrook? Well, our founder, George Booth, born in Toronto, uh, immigrates to Detroit as a teenager with his father. And so you have this sort of interplay of the Finnish curve and then the Canadian curve coming together. Now, in the earliest designs of the arrival feature, Palasma wanted these to go from white to gray granites and end in black granite. But through the course of designing, uh, Essentially, it starts out as a very abstract design, a sort of pure geometry, pure landscape intervention, but it gradually begins to take on these meanings. And I don't think that a modernist like Erosarnin could ever have been so um, explicit in his meaning, so at times tortured in his meetings, if you ask me. But this is the 1990s. We are coming out of the hangover of postmodernism where everything meant something and the more historical illusions you could incorporate, the better. And so even though this is very much abstract and sort of neo-modern or late modern, everything means something. So the black and white sort of transition, what did that mean? Nothing other than Mr. Palasma liked black and white granite. And so the decision was made, instead of just using colors, we would use different bores from specific places. And these places are all places that have granite um, quarries featuring granites that were pushed to Cranbrook at the end of the last ice age. So last week I talked about uh, how Cranbrook is a glacial moraine or a terminal moraine, which just means at the end of the last ice age, Cranbrook is where all of the ice stopped and then retreated back. It's why Bloomfield Hills and Ann Arbor are so hilly, and it is why Detroit is so flat, because if we come to our handy guide here, um, maybe you can see this in the screen. You can see these are all of the ice ages pushing down. Here is Cranbrook, and we are at the end of one of the ice ages. And so all of these granites end up at Cranbrook in small little pebbles, which were used for the walls. And here, Palasma goes to the source, and he goes to the quarry, and he bores out these very thin uh, examples of six Canadian granites. The alternative to doing this, uh, other than black and white, was that Palasma, um, Palasma suggested we take Cranbrook's latitude and then we go 60 degrees west all the way around the world. That gets you uh, six samples and we would use six stone samples at the same latitude from equal quadrants around the, the world. It didn't work out because there wasn't stone in each of the quadrants, so we stuck with the Canadian example. And I should wish you a happy Canada Day today. I hope that all of my Canucks and Canadian friends are celebrating. Um, sad we won't have fireworks tonight at the Detroit-Windsor border. 
So now that we have, we know what granite we're using, let's talk about how these are made. These are very tall and skinny. And originally, the whole arrangement was shorter. The wall was just four feet and then four six. It's now five feet. The columns were also shorter. But Dan Hoffman came out with cardboard and wood, and he built the entire arrival feature as a mock-up with his architecture students. Hoffman, of course, the head of the Cranbrook Architecture Department um, for about a decade, from 84 to 96. And so they build this mock-up and they realize the whole thing is too short. And so to get taller columns, the columns would also have to get bigger. But part of Palasma's design was that these be very thin landscape interventions, that they not be sort of Roman ruins. And so in order to keep the columns as thin as they are, they are held in tension. So these bronze caps that you see on each of the columns, those are connected to stainless steel cables that run through and then are bolted to the ground. So it's a post-tensioned column. The actual stone is doing um, none of the sort of structure work, the stone is supporting itself, and the steel cable that is tightened is what's holding the entire thing rigid. Think of those old toys where you could push the bottom and the uh, little duck or clown would collapse and then the string pulls it back rigid. That's what's happening here with these columns. Now, on the top of one of the columns, the decision was made to add an analemma. And so this is both an analemma and a uh, post-tensioning rod. Uh, and an analemma is simply the center of a sundial. So the entire thing can be thought of, the entire arrival feature can be thought of as an astronomical instrument. Um, there is nothing marked on the ground where this sun would land. And because the trees, these not intentional trees have so grown up. We no longer, the analemma won't cast a shadow into our uh, disc any longer. But Palasma began to think of the arrival feature in terms of the monumental astronomical instruments at Jaipur and other sort of great landmarks of scientific history. And he envisioned that every morning, the Institute of Science would use a huge book and it would come out with chalk and it would draw onto the disc using, I don't know what to know where they were drawing it, but you would come from the Institute of Science and then draw your, uh, the day's sort of scientific readings, the time, the, the clock, whatever else you can gather from the sun. And so the analemma would go onto a temporary daily clock. To my knowledge, it never happened. I don't even know if the book exists. Correct me if I'm wrong. We also see a change in materials that demarcates the automobile side versus the pedestrian side. And then, unfortunately for Palasma, he had this manhole cover that he was not allowed to change. He couldn't change the sort of um, system that was already underneath the, the arrival feature. He wanted to do a reproduction in bronze casting of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. So he wanted to show off a Renaissance depiction of hell. So you would look at the manhole cover and you would see hell below it. Instead, it's a stainless steel disc that tells us the plumb line extending down from this point passes through the center of the earth and will emerge from the surface of the Indian Ocean about halfway between Kerguelen Island and Perth, Australia, 12,737 kilometers below this point. And so the drain cover really takes us into this much larger scale. We've been thinking about the scale of Cranbrook and the scale of the arrival feature. You get up to the scale of Canada and Finland, and now we're dropping straight through the earth and thinking about earth as this sort of total environment. And Palasma also calculated uh, how many, uh, 900,000 years or whatever, uh, how far it is for the analemma to finally reach the other side of the 84-foot disc. And so he figures that will be the end of Cranbrook when the tilt of the earth has so shifted uh, that the arrival feature can cast across the entire uh, work. There are other um, lovely details like the black granite step that is meant to enhance the reading of the disc for the pedestrian. So as you walk past the arrival feature, you can see how uh, his disc is left perfectly um, 
disc-like. It's not level because it sheds water, uh, but then he brings the sidewalk below it and he highlights the difference with the granite step. Then behind it is this low wall, which has a lovely bronze railing, which if more people would come and sit and lean on the bronze, it would polish, which was one idea. And then between the trees, between the original firs, you were meant to see down to Kingswood Lake through the old meadow past the Richard uh, Nunes sculpture. And then there are also these indirect bronze lights here that meant, are meant to cast light and sort of glow in the little quadrangle. It was Palasma who suggested the initial street lights that Dan Hoffman had designed were too bright and were, would wash out the sort of view of the woods. And so Palasma was very concerned with his own arrival feature that when you came up to it, you saw the vertical runway lights, but you didn't see other lighting. And so this lighting across the back law, wall is meant to just be really soft and indirect. It's a very Sarnan-esque way of lighting a building to not be able to see the fixture, um, but to, or to not be able to see the light directly, but to reflect it off the surface and back. So let's see, have I missed any of the details? The wall that you see popping out there is from a, a parking structure that was built in 2005. So originally, um, Palasma was involved in reconstructing what had been a sort of very messy intersection with the Institute of Science into this much more lovely curve. And then there is the, the sort of radiating arcs that come out. You'll see there's the arc of the back wall, which is both bench and wall, but then there is this cast concrete um, arc as well, which shoots you and provides the path below the arrival feature. And so uh, this was the, the way that you're meant to sort of go and explore the rest of the Cranbrook landscape. I neglected to mention how these stones are divided. So I, I talked about how they are held in place with this post-tensioning system, but the stones themselves are also arranged in Fibonacci's sequence. So Fibonacci's sequence, for those of you who are not in middle school, uh, we have one here, one here, one plus one, two, two plus one, three, three plus two, five, eight, 13, and so on. And so Palasma talks about how using the Fibonacci series in reverse with the smallest stones at the bottom and the largest on top is a little hint that maybe these columns aren't doing the work of stone themselves. Uh, maybe it's some other system that's actually holding them up. And that's what lets us have the smallest stone at the base. Now, originally, the idea was to have a stainless steel sign at this intersection that pointed left to science and right to art, and that being the main division of space. But I am sure that all of you who have driven up to this intersection instead figured out exactly what Palasma was doing, which is bronze, science, left. Six columns made of stone, that's the six columns of the art museum, so art is right. That is probably the most subtle way that we could sign um, which way you're supposed to go at this T intersection. Now we simply don't attempt it. So if you make the wrong turn, you'll figure it out soon enough and make a U-turn. Um, but it was intended that the uh, bronze wall direct you left and the stone columns direct you right. There were unfortunate additions. The words art and science were bolted onto the bronze wall for about a decade kids kept stealing the letters and so the decision was made to take them off which did bring the integrity of the sculpture back in into contention you can see the remnants of the signs where a material that was not bronze was used and it created this off gas and you can see where bronze pins were quite beautifully added back into the piece so pro tip to all you bronze wall owners out there don't drill holes through them Originally, and it had to be cut because of um, budget, originally there were going to be many more holes through this. The major stars would have actually been hollow. And so if you were a pedestrian sitting on the wall and a car came over the hill, the headlights would shine through the wall and it would be a, uh, you would see the stars shining through the bronze. But in order to have them as sort of pinpricks of light was going to be quite a, um, 
additional expense, and it was already the most expensive part of this project to cast the bronze. So if anyone has any questions, um, let me know. Tom, I don't know how the columns were made or quarried. Um, I don't know if they're single bores. I mean, they look like bore samples from back when I used to be in architectural firms and you would get sample materials from a quarry. They would always send you these um, just round sort of two inch columns that were just the bore samples where they built drill straight down. That's what they look like to me, but I don't actually know if they were quarried as blocks and then rounded or if they were quarried straight down. It's a good question. So this was finished in 1995. Dan Hoffman was involved from start to finish. He was involved in getting Palasma as a guest speaker here in March of 93. He was involved in running the faxes between Helsinki and Bloomfield Hills. He was involved in um, fighting for this project with the Cranbrook Board of Trustees. Um, not fighting for its existence. There was great enthusiasm, but he was the, the representative for Palasma here at Cranbrook. And he also intended, like the other projects, he intended to oversee the work. And originally it was going to be the Cranbrook architecture students who actually paved the disc. I don't know, the record isn't clear, um, how much student work was actually involved in this project. A lot of it had to be subcontracted because it was just really specific and really niche work. Um, that unlike the Woodward entrance feature where you're using nuclear power plant columns and turning it into a building, um, this, this is, doesn't have quite the same opportunities for student work, I think. I could be wrong. If any students are watching, I learned a lot last week after I went live. Thank you everyone who sent me a message and answered a lot of the questions I had. So if you worked on this project, do you send us a note? Now part of this whole project was rebranding campus. So all of our signs, which were designed by Catherine McCoy, who was head of Cranbrook's Department of Design um, before it was split into 2D and 3D. She, with her husband, um, Michael McCoy, who was more of the sort of three-dimensional objects, Kathy was more graphic design. They designed all of these new Cranbrook directional signage. They include the new Cranbrook community seal, uh, which before 1973, there was no Cranbrook educational community. We were the Cranbrook Foundation that had its own letterhead. This was designed to use on community-wide properties. And you see that it's the perfect circle from Aliel Saarinen's Cranbrook Academy logo. It's been reversed, so instead of a C this way, it's this way. And then there is this lovely crane that is adapted from Henry Scripps Booth's uh, brick crane on the side of the Academy Administration Building. And then here are the three institutions, Art, Science, Education, Art Academy, Institute of Science, Cranbrook Schools, that are the sort of uh, River Rouge, the foundation of all of Cranbrook. And so that's pressed into this concrete barrier, which you'll see is very similar to the one used at the arrival feature. So it's the collaboration between graphic design and the architect and then bronze plaques that are bolted to the front. At the same time, the arrival feature in Woodward Avenue entrance were being completed. Our lighting system was reworked, and these are designed by Dan Hoffman, and Wani Palasma served as a consultant on these um, light fixtures that are indebted to Alvar Alto in his indirect lighting system. So the light shines out of the torch and reflects off of the paper chip. And these were made uh, at the Cranbrook Architectural Office. So these were made by students who would take time off to work for Cranbrook and for other young architects who were working in the revived Cranbrook Architectural Office. So um, those are the holes that you wondered about. I think that those are just a part of the casting of the concrete. So when you cast concrete, you always have a a uh, smooth side and a rough side. It's very difficult to cast concrete with a full 360 degree finish. And so I think that those holes are part of the um, structure, the, the mold that the concrete is cast into. And those holes help support the structure and then they help release the concrete. They also are where the bronze is attached. So the signs were meant to be adaptable. You could add new uh, 
panels, you could add new letters to the signs. And they do change based on what department you're in. So here we are at the Art Academy, and you see that we have the CA, the Aleel Saarinen designed logo of Cranbrook Academy of Art pressed into the concrete. And then there is the additional light fixture, the little mushroom cap light fixtures, which were again designed by Hoffman and made here. And to my knowledge, correct me if you've ever found another one, this is the only one that has the CEC logo cast into it. And so I don't know if this was the test one, if this was the first one. Um, I kind of like that it's the only one that has it because Cranbrook is all about asymmetries. And so it's nice to have one light fixture that's different from all the rest. Palasma is still alive. He is still teaching. Um, he still lives in Helsinki. He has a number of different buildings out there in the world. Most of his projects are more like the arrival feature, sort of poetic, almost land art um, projects. He has one major project in downtown Helsinki. Um, read his book and then see the project. It is a shopping mall, let's be real. Um, it is what I used as a bus to get to my couch surfing location when I was in Helsinki a decade ago. And if my Finnish friends are watching, hello Sasu and Sala. Um, Plasma is, his book is still required reading in most architecture schools and programs. So he does really live, uh, continue to be influential in his books and writing. I wanted to end today's Live at Five um, with a brief update about Live at Five. We are changing somewhat um, going forward. So this is going to be our last longer tour. The Live at Fives are going to get shorter and also get more specific. So we've been doing tours that are really equivalent to what you get if you come to campus and take a full building tour. Um, we are taking next Wednesday off for the 4th of July holiday. And when I come back a week from next Wednesday, two weeks from today, um, we're going to have shorter Live at Fives that are more specific. So uh, I think the arrival feature was a good transition because it is just one object, but it has a lot of different detail to it. Um, and so if you have individual works of art or individual projects, um, that you're interested in, send me a message. I'm always happy to do suggestions. We're not stopping live at five. Um, it will still be on Tuesdays on Instagram and on Wednesdays here on Facebook. But we want to ramp up some additional programming um, with me and with other guest lecturers. We're thinking about how we can begin to welcome you back to campus and how we can do different digital events. So if you're not signed up for the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research email list, make sure that you go to center.cranbrook.edu and sign up. Uh, that is where these new events are going to be announced. Um, we have in the hopper uh, an event about the Japanese garden restoration and the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House landscape restoration, as well as a lecture on Studio Loya Saarinen and her weavings, a lecture on the Bauhaus in Cranbrook. Here's the kicker. Uh, we do have to uh, raise money to support the work that we're doing. So these are going to be, uh, again, virtual and in-person events, but they will have a small fee attached to them. So. Um, Live at Five will continue for, uh, uh, for the time being. There's no plans to end it, but it is going to take a little bit of a different form. If you're my family or if you are one of the few who watches me on both Instagram and Facebook, the Facebook tours are just going to become a little more similar to Instagram, which are shorter tours and more tailored to individual objects. I have certainly enjoyed doing this the past 13 weeks. And I know that there are still some projects that we haven't gotten to, and those are still on my list for tours. So um, don't be too sad. Instead, be excited that we are thinking about how the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research can go forward strong into the future and bring you more and different programming. Um, and we're also working with uh, 
Deborah Rice, our head archivist, on bringing you more archives-based programming. And so there's going to be no shortage of opportunities to learn and connect and visit Cranbrook. Um, keep your eyes posted for those. And since I'm having a little marketing push here, um, those of you who don't follow the Cranbrook Kitchen Sink blog, it's the blog that I publish every Friday. There's four writers, archivists and registrars, and that's every Friday afternoon. So if you need even more Cranbrook, make sure that you follow the blog. And of course, as always, if you enjoy Live at Five, if you enjoy these tours, we so appreciate any donation uh, that you can provide to help keep these virtual free tours going in a time where we're not doing any of our paid programming. And you can find the donation link on the Cranbrook dot, uh, or center.cranbrook.edu website. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, I have appreciated all of you who've been with me. Uh, I think I need a break, which is why I've decided to take the 4th of July week off from Live at 5. But I'll be back in two weeks. Um, possibly from Cranbrook Gardens. We'll see where I'm coming from then. And I look forward to continuing to walk around campus looking like a crazy person, holding my cell phone in front of me. If you have any other questions, make sure to leave them in the comments or send us a direct message. And I hope everyone has a very happy Canada Day, a very happy 4th of July this weekend. Be safe, wear your mask, Next time that you're on campus, we are officially reopened to uh, visitors as of today. So feel free to come and walk around um, without that hesitation of can I be here or not that we've maintained for four months. So come to campus. I hope you all enjoy the arrival feature even more the next time that you're here. Um, and I'll see you soon.